Hey everyone, Colin Teske here, and uh, tonight I'm going to be sharing with you a sermon, on, a message sermon that I've been working on for Young Adult Gathering we've got coming up here. So, here we go. As many of you know, uh, we'll be studying Titus in the coming weeks, so go ahead and open to it. And while you're doing that, let me ask you this. Have you ever felt as though you were powerless in a situation? Sometimes I feel this way towards much of life. I mean, what can I, one dude, do to change the world around me? I'm powerless. I know many people feel this way about the government. I mean, it's crazy. What can I, one person, do to change all of the madness that's going on? And I recently had a conversation with a friend who works in the medical field uh, about the concept of the lotus of control. Meaning, most people either have an internal or external view of what has power over their body and minds. And there seems to be a clear difference in the health of each. Those who believe that their health is controlled by themselves, as an internal uh, view, tend to be healthier than those who believe that their health is controlled by the world around them, or that they are essentially powerless to the system around them. And the reason I ask these questions is because the church is at an interesting place in its history. And I don't want you to feel powerless to the system, powerless to the direction and the future of the church. I chose to study Titus because it's, an, it's a letter written to a young leader that anyone, and young adults specifically, can learn much from. And being a part of the church and helping Grow the church is what it's all about. But I had no idea how applicable it would become. Titus applies to everyone. Whether we are involved in the body of Christ, but here is why Titus matters to you. The church's future is not out of your control. And I believe that every young adult, scratch that, every person is important in growing and improving the church because of the precise instructions Paul gives to Titus. So, who is Titus? It can be presumed that Titus worked with Paul at Ephesus during his third missionary journey, uh, then went with Paul to Corinth, and then he went to Crete, which is what we are reading about here. Uh, so we see in chapter 3 that Paul asked Titus to meet him at Nicopolis, from where Paul sent him to Dalmatia, which is modern-day Yugoslavia, uh, which can be seen back a page in your Bible at uh, 2 Timothy 4.10. Paul and Titus uh, have traveled through the area on an evangelical, evangelistic mission and set up churches. Uh, we see in Galatians 2.3 that Titus is a converted Greek who is uncircumcised, and Paul's endorsement of Titus for ministry communicated his stance on circumcision quite clearly. So, so it's obvious that Titus is a rad dude. I mean, Paul was sending him all over, and he was a converted Greek. As far as we know, not a Jew who experienced Christ himself or the early miraculous happenings in Acts. But Titus wasn't the only one. Paul had established churches churches with lots of young, other, often young leaders. 14 to 20 more churches, depending on who you ask. People like Titus, Timothy, Onesimus, just to name a few. Paul found people who were dedicated to Jesus, a part of a community, and let them lead through the Spirit, this new community, the church. So, uh, let's jump into Titus uh, after a brief introduction, which says, uh, this is verses 1 through 4, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time, and which now, at his appointed season, he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God, our Savior. So that's Paul's introduction, his reading, his reason for writing, his credentials, 
his yeah his reason for writing to Titus and uh, the church on Crete. Um, so after that, Paul gives um, precise instructions to grow a strong church, and this is Paul's first point. Um, he says, the reason, and this is verse 5, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Um, so, very obvious here. Uh, Paul doesn't uh, leave it up for debate why he's right. He said, the reason uh, I left you in Crete is that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town. So first of all, Paul had to address why he left Titus. Paul had been working with Titus. They were a ministry team. So it would have been hard to just break things off. He needed a reason. And he didn't want to just ditch him. He was putting him to work, giving him a mission. The church at Crete was left unfinished. And it was Titus's role to finish it by appointing elders. Remember that that is how Paul had been planting churches, by leaving mentors with groups of people who wanted to worship Jesus. Really, it's not any different than what Jesus did with the disciples or what Campus Crusade does with college students. Train, equip, and send, or in this case, leave. So there is a time when every member of a church, every member of the church, every member of the kingdom of God, starts making disciples. And ask yourself, where is God moving? How can I make more disciples? But when is the jumping off point? When do we become church growers? And Paul first addresses the most serious situation in Crete. Again, the reason for writing, the lack of elders, and he describes the characteristics of an elder. Verses 6 through 9. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild or disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Uh, but Paul, uh, that's verses 6 to 9. Paul doesn't stop there, though. He also tells what not to look for. In verses 10 through 6, he says, For there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain, one of Crete's own prophets has said, Cretans um, are always liars, evils, brutes, lazy gluttons. And I'm just realizing right now that uh, Cretans uh, is an insult that I've heard over time, you know, like you ungrateful Cretan. This is this must be where it comes from. Uh, I mean, he, again, he says Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. Um, Paul goes on. The saying is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharp, sharply, so that they will be sound in faith and will pay no attention uh, to Jewish myths or to the merely human commands of those who reject the faith. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciousness, uh, consciousness are corrupted. They claim to know God, but their actions, uh, they deny them. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Uh, what I love about these lists is that I can imagine David Letterman's old top 10 list skits. And uh, I just have uh, illustrations in my mind of what uh, the videos that would go along them with would be. But, um, but we see here Paul is talking uh, to the Cretans about people who were uh, distorting the gospel, talking about circumcision and the importance of it. Um, and remember, uh, Crete... Uh, 
Titus was an uncircumcised Greek. Uh, so he's right in there opposing these people. But more importantly, um, as he says in verse uh, 15, to the pure all things are pure, but those who are corrupt do not believe. Nothing is pure. Um, so it's not, uh, though in this situation, uh, it sounds like, and, and research shows it has to do with false teachings on circumcisions, uh, circumcision, but Paul addresses this in most, if not all, of his churches we see in the New, Test New Testament, some type of, um, of twisting of the gospel uh, for some other gain, gain other than growing the church. But here's the point. Paul is giving us a tangible, measurable list of characteristics of the elders of the church. And while not everyone's going to be an elder, this list is really for anyone who wants to make a difference in the church, which should be everyone because everyone is important in growing the church. Because this is Paul's ultimate point. Everyone has a job to do, not just the elders. In chapter 2, 1 through 6, he says, You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of, of respect, self-control, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women, to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. Whoever you are, young or old, Paul has instructions for you. And while it benefits you, the way you live, I mean, anybody who lived according to those things, uh, it would improve their life, it is for the sake of the church. You see, Paul is describing a multi-generational approach to church. And so a downfall that we can see in our modern church ministries uh, is that we have a ministry for every generation. And it's difficult for uh, the older men to encourage the young men to be self-controlled. And can you imagine a younger man teaching older men to be temperate? Um, <laughs> never in a million years, maybe. Uh, but do you know where this is happening? In mentoring. And so if we all have the opportunity to grow and improve the church through studying Titus, I want you to remember these words of Paul. My true son of the same faith. Perhaps the most important thing for being involved in growing the church and growing in faith is having true fathers and sons of the same faith. That's mentors. So find someone to teach you Paul's top ten list. And you will find someone to teach Paul's top ten list too. Make disciples, grow the church, further the kingdom of God, because everyone is important in growing the church. Let's pray.